In the digital age, our systems still perpetuate bias, inequality, and violence in the lives of women and girls. Technological progress is outpacing progress towards gender equality. This is not progress. On this International Women's Day, we make four calls. 1. Remove all barriers to access the digital world. 2. Educate and train women and girls in STEM. 3. Enable women to create tech that meets their needs. 4. Eliminate online gender-based violence. Today we power on to create an equal digital future for all. In celebration of this important day, we invited two outstanding women for an extended interview, as they have many personal stories that serve as encouragement for many of us. Women can be very strong and brave while being caring and gentle. Echoing the theme of the United Nations for this year, promoting gender equality and bringing women more opportunities will create greater potential innovations because with love and perseverance, we can overcome adversity and bring peace. Our second speaker is a great representation of a woman with love and perseverance. The interview is with Dr. Upal. She has joined us many times to jointly observe the different UN days. And today she has more stories to share with us. Let's welcome Dr. Upal. <music> Hello everyone. Our second special guest today is Dr. Kuljit Upal, world's first image scientist. Dr. Upal is bestowed with the esteemed Inspirational Polymath Award being an image scientist, aviator, educationist, entrepreneur, author, and creative director amongst many other hats that she wears. And for those who have been following our channel, Dr. Upal is a familiar face who has enlivened our events with many of her wonderful stories and insights. And as we celebrate International Women's Day today, we have invited Dr. Upal once again with more in-depth stories today in hopes to encourage women around the world to be brave, happy, and empowered. So welcome, Dr. Upal. Thank you so much, Judy, for that very warm introduction. It's always a pleasure to be on this platform. I think Fopal is doing a great uh, job in terms of bringing in people, discussing topics, and I think it's just wonderful. And that's why I'm connected, as you said, with the, the organization and all you wonderful people since a while now. Thank you and happy Women's Day to everyone happy, on this channel. Indeed. Happy Women's Day to everyone, and I'm very excited to have more time today with Dr. Upal to look into more of her stories and what has happened, her journey. So our first question is, what was the biggest challenge you faced as a child, and how did you overcome the challenge to grow up as a beautiful, strong woman you are today? All right, it's ironical, but I did have a challenge as a child. You know, I was just six months of age and uh, I was afflicted with polio in my right leg. And of course, nobody really realized it at home. It was only when I started growing in my primary school days, when while others walked normally, I was kind of dragging my leg and uh, it caught the attention that something was probably wrong with her leg. And uh, time went by and of course, by senior primary, I became an object of ridicule in one way. People would laugh at the way I would walk and make fun of me. So much so that one fine day, I remember having gone to my father and asked him, what is wrong with me? Why do people keep laughing at me? Why do they make fun of the way I walk? And he looked me straight in the eye and he said, there's nothing wrong with you. For me, I think it was a breakthrough moment, a turnaround moment, wherein I took what he said as the gospel truth. And um, I told myself there's nothing wrong with me because it was my father telling me that, right? And uh, having said that, I realized I definitely need to do something about that leg, and so did my father. And we worked very consciously on strengthening that leg. 
And I think I became a disruptor of sorts, a positive disruptor very early in life because of that. So as time went by, by middle school, I was a classical, Indian classical dancer. I was a gymnast. I had turned into a national level athlete. I was a parade commander at the Republic Day Camp. I became a parasailer and a pilot and journey continued. So I probably did everything that defied the fact that somebody with polio cannot do. In fact, even more recently, I've had some very bad injuries and accidents and I was laid up in bed for a few months uh, and a probable case, as they say, for um, paralysis. And I think it was just sheer mental power that actually kind of took me out of it. And like I said, I've been a healthy disruptor and I've always believed that when it comes to these sort of challenges that you experience as a young child, as long as you move in the right direction, you actually land up achieving far more than what ordinary people would have achieved. And uh, I think that's what's happened to me. So I'm very happy that uh, the challenge came in so early in life. And today when people look at me, they don't even know that I've ever had polio in my life because I, I walk like anyone else. Of course, a lot of hard work went behind it. So I'm my own benchmark because it's not fair to compare apples and oranges, like they say. I'm not in competition with anyone. My goal is to just beat my last performance, which was, let's say, yesterday, and just keep being my best version. And uh, I think over a period of time, as you keep discovering what you're made of, uh, or you go back again into your childhood, like I've had some incidents where certain encoding in the mind happened as a child where you feel you're not good enough in maths, or you're not good enough in this, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Over a period of time, I think logic and wisdom prevails. The maturity to view things in perspective happens, and you land up that you can, you know, you land up realizing that you can overcome all of that, and you need to kind of just break those shackles, break the barriers, and move forward. And that's exactly what I do. And I think I go by Nelson Mandela's uh, quote of "I never lose. I either win or I learn." That's the way my life has been going. And that's beautiful. You can only imagine how strong your mentality had to have been to overcome the physical, the strengthening, the practices. And it's very touching, though, for me, of what your father had said. You know, I think that he was a strong power in, in that journey, too, you know, growing yes. up and overcoming that. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's what beautiful parents do. Yeah, I agree, agree. <laughs> I have beautiful parents. And I'm thankful every day. And um, it's also interesting to learn about your transition, you know, from your overcoming your challenge from within, you know, in your individual self. And how did that kind of grow, you know, to start your journey of bringing positive change to the world, something a little bit bigger? How did that begin for you? So I think everything kind of settles into the way you look at things in your childhood and also the environment you were brought up in. Like, I would say the mild shades of what you will do later in life probably start as early as childhood. For example, in my home, I it was very common for me to see that my father and my mother would um, give 10% of their salary to the Navy. And I remember them setting in certain set of values in, in the way we were as children, uh, where gratitude and giving was an absolute platform which had to be done at every point in time and i think i remember an incident when one of my uh, classmates way back in class five uh, she was an orphan and she was living in the convent there where i was studying and i remember her toes peeping out of the shoes one fine day and i just told her hello is your shoes are torn and she said yeah i told sister and sister said we don't have the funds now uh, let's just do it next month or something like that Without even thinking twice, I got out of my shoes and we exchanged shoes and I said, you take mine. So it didn't, it's not that I put a conscious effort there. I think these things happen because you're being instilled with certain values. And I, I was never discouraged at my home front to do something for society. Having said that, I think as time went by, I was also part of certain uh, social organizations, very voluntarily, which helped me shape my mindset towards integrity, towards development and contribution. I used to contribute to the lives of slum children uh, to get them a life of dignity. Uh, somehow we have a lot of beggary in our country and I am so anti it. I don't like to see children begging. So I would um, walk into slums with some goodies and treats and you know books and color pencils and 
you know, catch all of these children and sit with them for hours together, tell them stories of great people like Gandhiji, Mother Teresa, and freedom fighters, and what the aspirations and the vision of our freedom fighters were for our nation, and that they should not beg of all things. So I would try and instill some qualities in terms of, um, you know, dignity of life. But I think for me, as I grew, the turning point was an incident which, ha which happened with Kashmiri women, about 212 of them. They came from remote parts of Kashmir, and uh, I wanted to make a difference in their lives, in their personality. So I remember having, you know, engaged with all of them, and I tried to convince them that let me please make a difference to your lives, and let me teach you English, let me teach you some vocational skills, and, you know, anything that will get you up on your feet and you can be independent because these were wives of soldiers and you know th there's no guarantee that your husband is going to be there all the while because the nature of the job is such so i'm very happy that i over a year trained them on their entire personality they were able to start speaking in english some of them became beauticians some became montessori uh, teachers some learned vocational skills like carpet making etc etc and after that one year engagement, I somehow, from their input and their feedback, that they were now ready to take on the world, I got the confidence that I could do this for this 212 section, then why can't I try it for a larger group across the world? And that's, I think, uh, what happened. And alongside, I remember, in 2013, if I'm not mistaken, there was a Fiki report that said that India is slated to be one of the youngest nations in the world by 2030. And I wanted to contribute to society, to the younger crop of my country and the world. I mean, here was a statistic I saw where I could do something since I was knowledgeable enough to do something. So I had pursued my research, as probably a lot of people are aware, and I became the first image scientist and all of that. But the whole modus operandi was, how can I use this knowledge that I acquire to make a difference to the youth, empower them, and not just the youth, also the women who probably are, are taking, let's say, are taking a hiatus from work, or are not confident enough to, you know, go and explore, or dare to dream, and so on and so forth. And that's where I actually pushed my mission. I'm on a PSR, a personal social responsibility to the world right now, wherein I want to make a difference to the persona and image of millions of youth and women, especially the ones who are deployed. So I think somewhere down, if you're asking me this question about when it started, like I shared, it started young, but I'm happy that there's been this entire you know, metamorphosis in the journey. And today, as a researcher, as a scientist, as a humanitarian, I am singly focusing on being able to make that positive difference to people across the world and help them, help the youth and women to, you know, kind of dare to dream, do whatever they feel like to, and not feel curtailed in any manner. Well, that's beautiful. So sometimes it's one incident, but oftentimes it's a buildup of many things, and our environment is very important. So it actually encourages me to continue to do things that in the beginning might not seem like a big change, but it does influence those around us. I get influenced. I'm, you know, influenced by your story. So we're going to continue with these efforts. And uh, my next question for you is actually one of the things that you said, um, we've seen online as well, that you said we are all in a constant state of evolution today. And it is important to be in the same rhythm as the world to obviate self vegetation. And how do you help yourself to be become within the same rhythm, rhythm as the world. How do you do that? I like the fact that my quotes are catching attention. <laughs> uh, yes, I do believe the world is very dynamic today. There is constant evolution. There is a need to be relevant, especially in your prof professional domain. And I think it doesn't apply only to me. It applies to everybody. I think it's important to be aware of where you stand what is where you aspire to be and learn to bridge the gap. What are the things you need to be able to bridge the gap is something every person needs to assess for herself or himself. And you need to build your skills accordingly. Obviously, we're talking of relevant skills for your area. I mean, generically, it's good, but it doesn't really bridge the gap. For example, me as an educationist, 
for me, I have to be updated. I'm a researcher, as I said, and I'm also a pioneer in my subject. That puts in a humongous responsibility um, on me, especially because there are people today following what I'm doing. They're reading my papers. They're reading the models that I'm creating. And so there is a sense of responsibility that I have to keep on researching. I have to keep studying. I have to keep learning. Read more. Update yourself continually. And create more and more. So as an educationist, I think the first thing I do for my professional work is to ensure that I am constantly providing to the world brand new information and um, the fact that they can consume it and get back to me with more doubts and, you know, inspire me to do more work and so on and so forth. So that journey is always on. I've always believed you need to stay on top of your game. Um, you know, an incident, a very funny story comes to my mind. It's not funny, actually, but it's a, it's a true story. I remember knowing this uh, art director in advertising years ago who was a brilliant painter. When that time, we weren't really using Photoshop and Corel Draw and Illustrator to make, uh, you know, images. I'm talking of way back in the 80s. It was a very common thing to kind of, you know, draw or paint and then take, you know, snapshots of that. He somehow never grew. Even till date, he only paints. Guess what happened? He lost his job because he didn't update himself. Now, that's the critical part. If you don't stay relevant, you are damaging yourself. You're damaging your career ahead, your professional work ahead. And that's why I keep saying the need to be relevant is imperative. So you need to constantly invest in yourself, especially with regard to knowledge. And you must know what is your technical differentiator so that you are the one, the go-to person for your field of area or your field of expertise. And that's what I think as the first image scientist I've been trying to do. And of course, having said that, I think I have the humility to look around and see people in my space, in my field, in my area of work, and see what is it that they're putting out there. Maybe sometimes they have some interesting information they've seen somewhere else, which I have not seen, and they share it. I'd be humble enough without any ego to go there and learn and absorb that. Because I think we're looking at knowledge in the larger perspective and not about the knowledge that Dr. Kuljeet has created versus someone else. I think that should never be the reason that you move ahead and, uh, you know, get yourself going. But it's important to be vigilant because it's the sake of the larger purpose, like I said. Be an avid leader. Uh, sorry, an avid reader. I think one should be in a state of emergency when it comes to growth and evolution. And I say that, I know emergency is a very strong word. People would be like, why is she saying emergency? But the fact is that until you put growth and evolution in that sphere of it being an emergency, you will not take action. I've seen a lot of people saying, yeah, I'll grow. Maybe I'll do this. You know, I'll do this learning every three months down the line and I'll do this then and then. And so we keep procrastinating. And I think until you make it an emergency, you will never, ever be able to go forward. That for me is my way of functioning. Also, I think over a period of time, um, so that I don't obviate, or I don't become irrelevant, I have learned the art of multitasking. And of course, growing my interpersonal skills, I think there are big advantages in today's scenario. Uh, we need to remember that every thought will lead to an action. That action done repeatedly will lead to a habit, which carves your character. And ultimately, that, of course, creates your reputation. So I think, and we know that everybody's reputation, by the way, is unquestionably vital in today's times, especially in the digital era that we live in. It is the person's most tangible and most marketable asset. And we should be working on it very systematically to create the desired impact. But that is a byproduct of you having invested the time and faith in yourself, in making yourself relevant, in making sure that you are in rhythm with the world around you. So you need to develop symbiotic relationships with professionals across hemispheres, engage in a consciousness that speaks of oneness, of, um, of trust, of love, of commitment, of sustainability. And I think all of these put together is growth and evolution. So that's the way I've been trying to always do. I mean, I, I'm always engaging with people, building up more relationships, growing, learning, and all of this, there is no ego at all. There's no space. I go with uh, Einstein's uh, theory of, you know, knowledge and uh, ego are inversely proportional. I truly believe that. So I think that's the way I deal with 
trying to stay relevant and uh, making sure that I'm in rhythm and I don't get obviated into self-vegetation. And that's a great state of mind to kind of keep positive at the beginning of the day to know that there is something waiting for you to explore, to find out. And Dr. Upa, uh, to, to me, I think you're a rep- great representation of United Nations uh, theme this year with digital innovation and technology for gender equality, because not only does Dr. Upal try to improve herself, but she has the heart of compassion, as we mentioned earlier, from childhood to her you know, earlier years to start to share and care for others. And I think that's the best way to integrate technology is not just the the, the the most advanced technology that's important, but how we use it, how we use it to bring positive change and influence in the world. So um, let us all be encouraged to have a state of emergency in our minds to continue to learn, uh, keep keep us on our toes and always be moving and so um and my next question for you dr upal is what do you think of the strengths and values of a woman you know in celebration of today that can motivate change positive change in our world having been a part of multiple women organizations around the world and an office bearer for most of them from the women economic uh, women economic forum to the all ladies league to g100 the Women's Indian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, Creative Women, the Indian Women Pilots Association, and so on and so forth, and of course, NGOs that work with girls and women. I've seen a few traits. Actually, there are not few, there are a million traits <laughs> that women and girls have in them inherently. And I think they're great ways to be able to, um, you know, motivate change in our world. Uh, traits like love, empathy, care, forgiveness, commitment, dedication, harmony, conscience, inclusiveness, acceptance, positivity, reliance, uh, sorry, not reliance, resilience, um, integrity, excellence. I mean, I think there's a long list. Women have these innately in them. What sadly happens is that they are not aware that they have all of this in them. They don't believe they have the power within And uh, the day they do realize, and I think lots of them have now started understanding that they have so much within them. They are like beautiful diamonds um, with just a little dust hanging around on them, which just needs a little bit of removing. And they're right there to brilliantly shine. Um, I believe that women can be true harbingers for change. Uh, There's a concept that I have believed, and I'll tell you in India, we have this goddess of uh, strength, goddess of power, rather, Madurga. And we say she's the goddess of Shakti. Shakti means power, by the way. Now, I truly believe, personally speaking, that every woman is divine in her own way. She is the true representative of the goddess of power, the goddess of Shakti. And like I said, it's only a matter of her realizing that she has the power for all those things that I just spoke about. You know, she has the resilience in her. She has integrity. She has love, care, empathy, conscience, blah, 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 everything. Based on what I just said, I think when we look at the future, women are the true leaders and they can carry on making this change through the platform of leadership with love. You know, it's just not leadership as we read in the MBA books or, you know, management books. We're talking of leadership with love because she has that innate potential to go beyond just the books or what bookish knowledge teaches her because she has all these powers. They are like sacred weapons within her where she will have the empathetic element. She will have the loving element, even as a leader, to be able to see a person's viewpoint, to be able to forgive if somebody is making mistakes, to also be empathetic to somebody's challenges, to have the care and commitment uh, to have dedication because when she's at it, look at her, I mean, in her, let's say, in all her spheres, as a mother, as a daughter, as a working professional, as a sister, she's always giving 100%. I mean, catch a mother not taking uh, enough uh, care of her child, for example. No, it doesn't happen, right? It's a very rare, for, I haven't seen one today, by the way. So I think somewhere down, this whole concept of leadership with love is something 
that associates with women and the power that innately we all have. I do believe also having said that, that today the time has come when women can be the biggest support for each other. And this angle of sisterhood, if I may say, is also an area that can contribute hugely to women empowerment, where there is a handholding, a beautiful handholding between woman and woman. You know, we need to discover that way of doing it. And I think that will start with discovering the divinity within her and that power that she has and the capability she has to turn the world around and, you know, not just in her personal space, and her family and her work, but also change the world around her. That's what I truly believe can happen. And they are the true harbingers of change. They as in you and me also, we're part of the same fraternity. Yes, indeed. And you, I love what you said, it's not just the books. Everything that happens to us in our in our families, in our you know homes, mm -hmm. up to our communities, our world, it goes beyond that because otherwise a hug or a smile can mean so much oftentimes, right? And there is a lot of power. I love that. So leadership with love, let's look forward to that. Let's all work towards that. And Dr. Upa, my last question for you as encouragement throughout your stories, we felt that the love and compassion already. What last message would you like to share for the youth of the world? I'm very passionate about the youth. You would have guessed by now. So I will take a few messages for them right now. The first ones that come to my mind. Actually, I'll make it simple for them to understand. For all the youth who are there on this channel right now listening to me, being an aviator, let me give you an example. In the skies, you're in control of your aircraft. Okay? You set the heading when you start to fly in a direction from point A to point B. You set the heading and you start flying. The winds will try and push you, sometimes to the left, sometimes to the right, like life does, but you don't lose, right? Because your entire focus is on reaching your destination and you ensure that you get there. So I think somewhere down your vision towards the way you look at life has to be with a single-minded purpose. Take some time to understand what your purpose is and build your focus on it, but after you have decided what you want to do, just go there in a very focused manner from point A to point B. There is no way, nothing can stop you if you've realized that you have it in you. And people, and, and like I said, you have to be mentally prepared. You will be pushed. Life does that all the while. A bird sitting on a branch is never afraid of the branch breaking because its trust is on its own wings and not in the branch, right? So always believe in yourself because self-confidence is the first requisite to great undertakings and it will play a very critical part in our lives. And that's what we need to achieve here. You need to become like a true warrior from inside and from outside. You know, having that immense strength from within and the indomitable power to overcome challenges. You become like a force of God with a warrior mindset that is authentic and is based on core values that you stand for. Everybody's values are slightly different from each other, but broadly speaking, you need to identify what you stand for. And this warrior has a vision. She plans and systematically builds her ammunition for the journey ahead and gives her best in anything that she puts her hands into. Okay, she is her own benchmark. She keeps raising the bar every single time. And most importantly, she doesn't give up. And I think that's very, very, very important. You know, in fact, this journey that I've spoken of, a lot of people ask me, how do you get confidence? I've mentioned this whole journey in that book of mine, Prim and Powerful. So if you think you want to even go there and read books or read somebody else's books on confidence building, if you don't feel you have the confidence, do that. But understand that you need to build your warrior mindset. And then nothing will stop you. You'll be undeterred. You will dare to dream on anything. And I think it's only fair that you must have a sense of self-belief that you can achieve anything you put your heart and mind into. Uh, I've already told you about being authentic. That's very, very important. Another thing is invest in yourself continually. You heard my story earlier. I've constantly been investing myself. Your journeys have just begun. You need to look at yourself as a product that needs to keep getting better and better and better, right? And like I said earlier, we live in a digital era. 
you're out there, you need to imbibe, grow, evolve. These have to be the words that you are constantly resonating with. Stay focused, learn from your mistakes, and work hard to achieve your goals. And lastly, challenges don't come to destroy you. You've heard a little bit about my journey. I'm sure there are lots of people who are, have very inspirational stories. You will realize there's this common uh, denominator. Challenges have not come to destroy us. They have come as opportunities to discover our hidden potentials and our strengths. So it's very important to embrace challenges as strengths. And when you do that, I think it's also important to choose the right role models you have in life. I know it's very normal for a lot of people to pick up uh, certain people who look good and they're celebrities and stuff like that. And there's no harm in doing that. I mean, probably you'll learn how to dress well from them. But if you are inspired by somebody's journey, I think, and you, you can connect, I think it's important for you to build your connection beyond just listening to their journey. Follow them, understand what mistakes they made, how they came uh, across it, you know, onto the other side of the fence, how they overcame these challenges. All of these are going to actually help you to make yourself better, larger, and more um, developed as human beings. And of course, remember, we create our future every moment we make choices and take decisions for our journeys ahead. So let's not wait for Christmas. Go ahead and take your first step now. Do it now. My love and best wishes to all the young future of the world. Thank you, Dr. Google. And as she promised, she gave us many, many different messages at the end for the youth, from the aviation story to the birds to the warriors. We are uh, interested to see what the youth picked up. So feel free to type in the chat box to share with Dr. Upal to which one you like the best. I like the one where, where I, like I like to believe in, in my, my own ways way. that I can be strong. There are things that I can do, I can accomplish. Once again, thank you so much, Dr. Upal, for joining us today, sharing us your very personal stories and words of encouragement. I have goosebumps right now, actually, from oh. thinking of, you know, the stories that you ended with, you know, the message to the youth, but I think it, it can expand to all world citizens. It's not too late for us to pick up our game and start start working towards what it is that we envision, the goal that we have set as we start to fly. So we hope that our viewers today also enjoy the conversation as much as I did with Dr. Paul. And happy International Women's Day to everyone. Thank, Thank you, you, Dr. Paul. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure talking to you as always. Thank you so much. Thank you.